TCC webinar. We'll get started in just a second. Um, we're going to give people a chance to log in here. I'm showing that we are at straight up noon on the East Coast, and uh, so we'll just, looks like people are logging in. We'll just give folks a, a few seconds to, to get logged in before we get started. Yeah, just hang with us for a few more seconds. It looks like some more folks are logging in, and so we'll get cracking momentarily. All right, it looks like some of the logging in activity has slowed a little bit, so we will now begin. Good morning or good afternoon everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Atticott with Cavion. We are pleased to, we've got a great session today. We call it the incredible journey to trustworthy test results, best practices for using statistics to invalidate scores. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined by real experts in a number of topics related to score invalidation. Um, I think pretty much everybody knows, anyone in IT certification knows Liz Burns, but that won't stop me from giving a little bit of introduction for her. Um, for 20 years now, Liz has been involved in IT certification, and uh, currently she's running NetApp's cert program. Um, I didn't realize that prior to entering our industry, Liz spent seven years as a turnaround specialist for the old big six consulting firm Deloitte and Touche, which no wonder she has such expertise in running programs efficiently and effectively. Um, what I do know about Liz, and you may also, is that she has been absolutely aggressive in protecting her programs from cheats and pirates, and not only trying to stay ahead of the cheats and pirates, but really penalizing them as best she can for their malfeasance. So very pleased to have Liz joining us. Um, also we have Jennifer Semko. Jennifer is a partner in the international law firm Baker and McKenzie. A big part of Jennifer's law practice involves working with high stakes test programs including certifications. And this may sound like hyperbole, but it's not. There may not be anyone in the world as expert in leveraging the law and agreements to protect certification IP. So um, we're, I'm really, really pleased to have Jennifer joining us today. Uh, next, Chuck Cooper. What, what can I say about this man? Uh, 46 years at IBM the last 10 of which he's been leading IBM CERT program. Uh, he's been a huge uh, contributor and supporter of the ITCC since our inception. He is vice chair of the ITCC for seven years. He spearheaded our security subcommittee. And the thing with Chuck, every time I interact with him, I learn something new, which how great is that? I totally appreciate that. So. Um, I'm Steve Atticott. I'm the founder and vice president of Cavion. I sit on the ITCC board and so really pleased to have collected this group. We've got a classic panel format today. Um, I'm going to pose questions to the members of the panel and they're going to respond. I think we've got really important content to cover. Uh, we'll draw some conclusions at the end. Throughout, everyone's on mute. But if you have questions, you can use the little GoToMeeting um, dashboard to pose questions, and we'll certainly reserve time at the end uh, for Q&A. 
just one other thing. Liz is going to have to leave us right at the bottom of the hour, so um, we may not be able to pose questions to her as we'd like to, but we're pleased she was able to, to fit, her into, fit us into her hectic schedule. So before I dive in with the panelists, I want to kind of set the stage here and, and frame the discussion. Why would an organization consider using statistics to invalidate scores? And the reality is there is a long tradition of using statistics for different purposes in testing, as, as I'm sure many of us know. Um, psychometrics relies on statistics to help ensure score validity. And what we see is that the traditional use of statistics um, provide a very objective and consistent means of measuring things that contribute to score validity, and that sort of consistent implementation is really critical uh, for the credibility of statistics. And we see that. When, when statistics are used for invalidation, as long as they are implemented consistently and uniformly, there is strong legal precedence in courts providing cre credibility of their use for invalidation. And I think it's also interesting, we, we focus a lot on proctoring and identification during the administration of an exam. But what statistics do is help us understand what may have occurred before administration and after, and really kind of Armos with superhuman powers of detecting the unobservable. If, if someone has perpetrated some sort of test fraud, not just during, but before and after the test, we can detect that. And when we do detect that, it, we're able to prioritize our, our resources and our responses appropriately. So we're really talking about measuring threats so we're better able to manage against them before, during, and after administration. And this last bullet here I love, um, when uh, really what the statistics do is empower us to flag scores that are already invalid. We just didn't know they were invalid. So they uh, we're armed with persuasive evidence of score and validity that we otherwise would never have known about. So with that as sort of a backdrop, Rochelle, can you launch our first poll? We've got a number of folks on the line here, and we just want to gain some background on your experience with the use of statistics for invalidation. So if you... Okay, yeah, so the question is, have you ever invalidated a score due to a statistical analysis flag? So please go ahead and select one answer on the screen. We'll give you just a couple minutes to vote. Looks like about 50% have voted. Okay, getting a few more votes in. We'll give you about five more seconds to pick an answer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and share the results with you all. Okay, well this is Chuck. I'm just going to comment a little bit. It's, this is good news. It looks like we've got two-thirds of the audience has done some type of um, invalidation and therefore hopefully this session will give you some additional ideas and then for the, those that have not yet, Maybe uh, this will give you the confidence to pursue ways to do it. So, Steve, back to you. Great. Thanks to you both. So, the first question, I wanted to pose this to Caveon's chief scientist, uh, Dennis Maines, but he was unable to join us today. But the question is, in your opinion, which statistics provide the most credible information concerning potential test fraud? And the good news is, there are several statistics that are very, very credible for this purpose. Um, in IT certs, we're all aware that 
for several years, we've suffered from situations where uh, entire item banks and answer keys are hacked. And so in response to that, programs, some programs have instituted Trojan horse items. So what we do is we intentionally miskey some non-scored items on the answer sheet. On the, uh, and so we're able to identify if a test taker has gained access to a pirated item bank and answers. Um, and in some cases, as Liz has done for years, actually invalidate when there is a, an apparent uh, high prevalence of Trojan horse use on a t particular test instance. So I didn't explain that very elegantly. But um, for a number of reasons, the entire hacking of the item bank an answer key has sort of uh, declined a little bit. So we've had to evolve to another type of item that we call the embedded verification item used on an embedded verification test. So Dennis Maines used to call this a test within a test, but he got tired of me calling him a twit. So um, that's why we settled on EVT. But really what this does is flags an individual who scores really well on items that have been published for a while, months, or even longer, but poorly on brand new items. And so why would someone score really well on old items and not well on items that are of similar difficulty on similar content? Well, when that chasm is really extreme, some programs will simply invalidate. We see the same sort of invalidation used for response similarity. For instance, um, I have clients that if Chuck and Jennifer have incredibly similar results, and, and it's not just that they, they had identical correct responses, it's that they have numerous identical incorrect responses. Well, one program, one of my clients, if the chance of them having such similar results, had they done their own work, is greater than one with 10 or one in 10 with 12 zeros, one in a trillion, they will simply invalidate. Not calling anyone a cheater, just saying you don't trust the score. Right along those lines, how can you trust a score if someone is operating at superhuman speeds? Um, they're answering items in just a few seconds that should take minutes to read, process, and answer. Again, maybe they're a proxy. Maybe they're a ringer. We don't know. We're just saying we can't trust the score. And so these kinds of items and these kinds of analyses are very valuable because they flag candidates who appear to have gained unfair advantage. They appear to have benefited through some sort of malfeasance. Also, as Liz will speak to, the analyses can be embedded in your quality assurance and scoring routines so they become very easy and efficient to incorporate. And lastly, much of what I just described can be shared with various stakeholders, your leadership, your legal group, your candidate community um, in easy to use language, simply and succinctly. It's easy for people to wrap their heads around these kinds of things. So I'm now going to keep moving and uh, want to pose this next question to Jennifer. Jennifer, what legal agreements or legal foundation should be in place in order to consider invalidations based on statistics? Well, first and foremost, anytime someone obtains access to your exam by registering to take it, you've got some kind of agreement in place with them. That might be online registration, a candidate handbook that's a little more formal, an honor code. But when you think about it, legally speaking, the agreement that they uh, sign on to in order to get access to your exam is a contract. 
and the terms that they must agree to um, memorialize your relationship with them. And that includes your rights and obligations with respect to the testing experience, as well as their rights and obligations. And if it's done right, your agreement with test takers will make expectations clear. And in the event that there's some problem in the future, what happens next will also be clear, including the remedies available to you, like invalidating a score. So for this reason, the candidate agreement that you put into place is incredibly important. It should be clear. It should be comprehensive. Um, if there's a dispute in the future over an action you have taken, such as invalidating a score in the face of some pretty uh, compelling statistics, a court may have to step in uh, and determine whether your decision was valid or not. And if that happens, nine times out of ten, the court is going to look to the terms of your candidate agreement to determine what your rights and obligations were. And the court is going to ask, did this testing program comply with its contractual obligations, and did it do so in good faith? And so for that reason, not only is the candidate agreement itself important, but your policies and protocols, which might be behind the scenes, are equally important. You want to develop those policies and procedures now, not in the face of a security breach when you're rushing to make decisions. And you want to implement them consistently and uniformly so as to um, increase the odds that anyone who reviews your decision will conclude that you acted in good faith. It's really beyond the scope of this webinar to get into detailed discussion about what might be some key components of a good candidate agreement. But when thinking about invalidation based on statistics, Think about whether your agreement puts candidates on notice that getting ad advanced access to exam content is a breach. That seems a bit obvious, but you'd be surprised how many times uh, test takers and their lawyers have um, taken the position that they didn't realize studying from materials provided by a friend or off of the internet or some other unscrupulous source would be a problem. And perhaps more importantly, think about your candidate agreement and what it says, if anything, about your right to invalidate scores and on what grounds, and your right to suspend or, or perhaps permanently prohibit access to your examination. Just some food for thought there. And the final couple of points I would make is, uh, one would be that you should treat your candidate agreement as a living, breathing document regularly review it in the face of new circumstances and new experiences um, and, and modify it as you need to to deal with new challenges. And also, don't overlook the value of your candidate agreement as a messaging tool. This is your chance to explain to your test takers what is and isn't appropriate. So don't pass up the chance to educate them a bit, which is sometimes necessary. And that's it. Jennifer, thank you very much. Um, sort of a long, well, as an extension of that question, when and how do you believe uh, one should recommend score invalidations to a board or a governing body? Okay, so let's assume you've got your rock solid candidate agreement in place and now you've discovered a breach or some kind of exam irregularity and you want authority to take some action against the candidate score. Or maybe you're looking for authority to establish a general policy for invalidating scores in certain circumstances. When is the right time to um, recommend that that step be taken? Well, when you have a good faith basis for questioning the validity of the score. Again, this goes back to that, that idea of good faith that I mentioned previously. And notice that I say a good faith basis for questioning the validity of the score. The question is not, can I prove this person cheated? Proving and cheating are terms we need to get out of our vocabulary in this context. So when you have 
based on the information in front of you, which could include some statistics. When you conclude you've got a good faith basis for questioning the validity of a score, that's the time to, to present the issue for potential invalidation. Now what constitutes a good faith basis is really going to vary based on the circumstances. But to be clear, under the reported court decisions out there, your testing program does not have a burden of proving, quote unquote, that someone cheated on an exam. Instead, the court, as I said a moment ago, is going to look to your test taker agreement and consider whether the invalidation decision was made in good faith. So how do you present this decision for consideration? Well, present a full and frank summary to your decision makers, whether they are a board or a committee or some other constituent of your organization. Give them the factors that weigh in favor of invalidation and those that weigh against invalidation. And when it comes to data forensics, a clear and simple layman's type explanation of the meaning of the statistics can be very important. Um, don't dump a 20-page complex discussion on their desk and expect them to fully understand it or maybe more importantly, six months later when the decision's challenged, don't expect them to be able to um, testify with confidence that they thought it was the right decision. I'll give you one quick example. We had a case uh, for a licensure program and we worked with Cavion and Cavion presented us with statistics for one particular individual and explained in a, in a really helpful sound bite, look, the odds of this person performing in the way that they did on this exam by chance are 1 in 27 septillion. <laughs> that was about all the decision makers needed to know. They didn't need a 30-page report. They didn't need an in-depth understanding. But that sound bite combined with a general education on the, the statistics and the analyses that were performed really gave them the confidence to make their decision to invalidate that person's score. And um, finally, if your program's procedures enable a test taker to present information or evidence themselves, make sure that your decision makers see that evidence and take it into consideration as well. Fantastic. Jennifer, thank you very much. So we've got another poll coming up. And uh, Rochelle, can you launch that, please? So the next question for you all is, if you have a formal statistical analysis program in place, what has been the biggest challenge faced in implementing it? So please go ahead and select one answer there. We'll give you a couple seconds to vote. Okay, about 40% of you have voted. Give you about five more seconds. Okay, looks like the voting has slowed down. I'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results with you. Now, I can't see those results. Liz, do you have any reactions to, to those results? Yeah, I'm very interested that legal and operational are 0%. I'm not surprised that political is high. But then, of course, 38% 38, 38 of the people said a combination of two or all three. Okay. And then none of the above, that would be interesting to, to so we're about one-third, one-third, one-third on political combination or none of the above, which is very interesting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> if there's well, none of the above, I'd, I'd love to know what it was, what issues, if any, they had enforcing, um, putting together enforcement stuff. Well, and, and, and I, um, that's sort of a wonderful segue because, Liz, I know that you have faced all of these challenges. So can you describe the internal challenges and obstacles you confronted in instituting your invalidation programs, operational, sure. legal, political? Sure. Um, actually, I would have answered, if I could have, uh, a combination of all three. Uh, I have it, I'm at this point implementing my third security enforcement uh, program into uh, my uh, a third organization. So I've done this for for many years, and at this point, I've found that while while 
all three of these elements are critical to address. As with as everything with security, you really need a comprehensive approach. It's not you know one silver bullet that cures everything. But to what degree these uh, you need to address one of these three categories really depends on the company. Also, when I was looking back over the years in the three different programs that I implemented, it did occur to me to just make a note here that um, the process of selling an exam security enforcement program, not just exam security, but the enforcement piece, selling that into an IT company at least, which is my experience, has gotten a lot easier as more IT companies have implemented these programs because now we can argue that there's an industry best practice. So all of the work that this organization and many other people have done um, to spread the word about exam security, the, 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 that's really benefit all of us. And it's, it's really a, a rising tide lifts all boats. So um, I just wanted to evangelize for that. Um, we're all making it easier for everybody else. But I would say, and um, the polls seem to suggest that one of the key elements, one of the most critical elements to be able to implement an exam security enforcement program is your internal support of the program. Um, so you'll really want to focus here. We are talking about impacting our customers and our partners. And this is a group that most organizations do not want to upset. Um, so your stakeholders will need to know what value this program has to your organization. And they'll want to know what they can expect to see happen, how their um, stakeholders, your partners and customers might be impacted. One note, one thing that I've learned is that when you are selling an enforcement program to your internals, they're going to ask about the people whose scores and certifications you want to invalidate. I really suggest you turn that conversation on its edge because the people they're worried about are maybe, if you're lucky, 5%, maybe 10% of your population. You want to turn it around and say, well, what about the other 90% of our customers and partners who are, not, who are taking tests independently and who are truly qualified and the results are reliable? These are the people that we're building this program for. And, the, and, and what we will do is we will sell the program as an increased value of the credential that this audience of ours works so hard to, um, to create. So what I've gotten is significant support when I've sold it that way. And then also I capture all the, the um, positive feedback I get from people who are in the audience in the certification program about this enforcement. And I channel that back up to my stakeholders. So I, make, I, I keep that kind of political engagement going as we get positive feedback from that 90% of the audience. So again, I would just suggest that you turn your argument on its ear and you sell enforcement as a value add to the uh, certification programs you launch. When you go to stakeholders, they're going to want answers to questions like, does legal support this and how will you implement it? So while political is really important, you've got to have all your ducks in a row. So um, you'll want to go and address these issues before you actually present to your stakeholders. With regards to legal, as long as you've addressed the issues that Jennifer just raised, which was in a really nice uh, comprehensive summary of the kinds of things you need to have in place, you should have no issue with legal. They may actually love the idea. I've had very positive responses to, from my attorneys when I've gone prepared. Um, operations are key, which I, the operational issues. I, I was surprised that no one found this as an issue because they're really key for scalability and fast response, really to develop an ROI, if you will, on your enforcement program and consistency. There are numerous and um, continuously evolving tools to help you with your exam security enforcement program. So Cabion, for example, really, really helps in identifying um, not just doing the statistical analysis, but identifying to Steve's uh, early point here the, de the detection techniques that you can use and how best to apply them. Um, several candidate management tools allow for automating the data forensics so that you can actually invalidate an exam result 
without giving the candidate a final pass. So this is what Steve referenced that he said I would talk about, which is that, in my opinion, we really need to consider exam security analysis part of the same type of analysis we do to determine a cut score. So that an exam is not, a, a pass is not a pass unless they pass both the cut score and your exam security threshold, both together. And we now have tools that allow you to do that within 48 hours of an exam attempt, so there's not a huge delay. So you'll see many IT companies implementing a provisional pass, which uh, NetApp does, Juniper does, EMC does, um, I think Cisco does, several um, companies do this. And then they don't actually grant a certification until the security analysis has been completed. And um, so the key here is that you don't actually have to revoke a certification. You simply don't pass the candidate. And that actually, your stakeholders like that idea so much better than taking away a granted certification. So if you're moving to an exam security enforcement program, I, I really, really urge you to explore all three of these aspects and the multiple options in the marketplace around the operational and scalability piece. That's it. Awesome. I love the metaphor of a valid score is meeting the cut score and the security threshold. Love that. Um, so another question is, if a program has a solid testing agreement in place with proctors and candidates, how much time, effort, and money do you estimate is required to invalidate a test score based on statistics? Uh, so again, uh, this will vary depending on your organization and how you're implementing your exam security enforcement program. The, pl the primary drivers on cost, assuming your program is set up, so, and I'm talking here about automating your program, if you will, but um, th the question specifically, Steve, I think you specifically don't address kind of the setup fees, which might be getting tools in place and getting a data forensic support in place but really the incremental each um, exam and validation. So the primary drivers for this are can you automate and do you allow appeals? So do you have to do the whole board presentation that Jennifer spoke to earlier? So if you can automate using one of the many tools out there in the process I described around not even granting a certification until you've done two analysis, the cut score and the exam security data forensics, then you're going to have some upfront costs to set this up, the detection techniques and the automated techniques and the tool. But with each incremental incident, it is very inexpensive. And it, so this is very scalable. And um, the revoke and the communication process is actually automated. So here at NetApp, we have this process. And in summary, the way it goes is each morning, any security issues that are presented to our program are presented to our program manager via our candidate management tool. They appear in an exam security queue. And then he research, researches each of the results very quickly using the tools at hand. And he determines what appropriate action per our documented policies and procedures need to be taken. And then he, he simply indicates in our system what we want to do with that incident. And then that action just flows through. The communications to the candidate, the storing of the, of the decision on their, on their um, record, it's all automated, and then he moves on. I would be surprised if he spends more than three hours a week in this process right now. And we're talking about a global program with uh, you know, test take, tens of thousands of uh, test takers every month. Um, when we use statistics and detection methods established by experts like Cavion, we don't really allow for appeals, again, we're using the same science and the same data forensics and the same legally defensible process as we use to set cut scores. And I, Jennifer, I think it was you that once said to me a couple of years ago when someone asked this question, how often do we um, take appeals on our cut scores? We don't. And that made me realize that uh, if we're using reliable statistics, why would we take appeals on our decisions to invalidate because we don't trust the score based on how people responded? So um, our revoke decisions are based on these statistics, so they're not debated. The candidate's exam attempt is deemed invalid, and they have no retest. So we don't have to, we at NetApp, um, don't have to file for any appeals. We just simply process it through. So long-winded answer to your question, Steve, is uh, um, the drivers are automation and uh, appeal. 
And if you automate and, and use statistics and don't appeal, your incremental cost is, is marginal, minimal. Thank you very much. Now, um, Liz, there was a question on Trojan horse use. Would you be, okay. do you have time to field a question? Sure. You know okay, I love so, those Trojan horses, Steve. Exactly. <laughs> You're the right person to ask this question. So if we use Trojan horse items, do we keep them out of the scoring so the candidate still passes if the candidate was honestly taking the exam? Oh, you, Trojans, by definition, have to be unscored because they have an incorrect answer key. So, yeah, Trojans are unscored items. They are only used for, for fraud detection, for um, invalidating exam results. Awesome. Hey, I know you have to run. Thank you so yeah. much for squeezing us in. I know um, it's always great to have you join us, Liz. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. So uh, now, Chuck, you've been sitting very quietly and patiently. You have a terrific case study to share with the group. I do, Steve. And in fact, to kind of bridge into the case study, um, we're gonna, I'm going to be talking in a moment about a case in which we have been successful in invalidating and identifying uh, non-independent test taking. Prior to that, we had a case over the last two years where we attempted to do the same thing. We were doing our testing, however, with server-based tests, which meant that both the question and answer key were being uh, st stolen and compromised, and therefore the only option that we had was high score, low time, and a Trojan horse. So we had good indicators on the high score, low time, but, but we did not have enough effort. We have hundreds of tests to get Trojan horses inserted into all of them. So we actually would identify cases in which we believed there must have been cheating, but we in fact could not invalidate because we did not have the Trojan horse. And legal was very specific, high score, Low time is not adequate because you just might step on the toes of somebody who is an expert or just simply moves through the question. So the Trojan horse was critical. We had problems getting enough of our tests with those in it, and therefore our older approach did not work. So what we now have is what I'm going to talk about here in the case study. Uh, we have a new method of doing this. The problem is the one you've heard overall most of our IT tests eventually find their way onto brain dump sites. We don't know who it is that took them. The candidates will acquire them either directly or indirectly and will use them to kind of memorize the questions and answers thinking that they are the valid questions and answers and they will end up with scores that we need to identify as non-independent test taking. And so that is the problem we set out to solve, and our solution is something called SCAM2. And you can see the definition of SCAM. The one that I told you needed Trojan horses we call SCAM1. And so this is a new iteration. The big difference is we now do all of our testing on an internet-based testing tool. Therefore, only the question goes down to the candidate screen, and you can't always stop them from being able to record it or have a bad proctor who turns their back. One way or another, they eventually seem to be able to get a hold of the question. Uh, what we wanted to do is be able to address this new technology approach, and we'll walk you through the case study starting with the next slide on how we do that. Um, in this case, much the same as what Liz said, um, we are not looking for a method of appeals. We need to not just invalidate, and in fact, invalidate is not always the case because in many of these cases, you'll see they actually fail the test. But we need to get to a place where we can take the punitive action of banning them from the program without appeal as a result of using our data forensics. So if we can advance to the next slide, um, what we have is nine different steps that we use in this process. The first six are shown here. Uh, we will locate the test on the brain dump. Sometimes you get emails, somebody says, hey, listen, I acquired this or I, I see this out on the web. When we find it, we'll purchase it and we do that through IBM security. We have a link into an internal team that will go ahead and uh, purchase those 
if you will, anonymously using Visa cards so that our program sponsors don't have to put their personal cards out there in the, in the open. Um, and then we have to validate those questions are, in fact, our intellectual property. And the reason for that is very often on a brand new test, you'll find these sites will list your test number and title. And you go, holy crow, it's been out there for like three days. How in the world could this happen? But when we go to purchase it, that test is not available for purchase. The sites have a screen scrape on different uh, vendor sites. They know when something new has been put out either through the vendor or through our testing vendors. They list it in hopes of getting requests or even money being sent in. And then if they get enough of those requests, they go and actually buy it. So you have to validate that it's actually there. Once you get it, what we are finding in step three is really the key. Because they're only able to lift the questions, we have been very fortunate that most of the people stealing our tests are idiots. And I'll just use that term loosely. But basically, they don't know the answers. They're just out there to steal it, sell it. And in order to sell it, they have to provide answers. So in this first case here, 37 of the 65 questions that were published on the brain dump site had wrong answers. So people who bought it and memorized it were, in fact, failing the test because they had more than 50% of the answers wrong. Um, and that was part of what helps us do the analysis and identify them. We also could find out exactly who takes it because we randomize our questions. And it's not foolproof, but in fact, if you've got 65 questions and you randomize the order in which you provide the questions, and then you look at everybody who's taken the test, so far we have found only a single instance of somebody whose questions when they took the test match exactly the sequence that's out on the brain dump site. And there's the individual, and we are able to go out and ban them for life. We also now have a stake in the ground to know exactly when the test was stole, stolen and, and analyze the information. So we take that information forward. We create a pattern of all of the answers, right answers and wrong answers, on the brain dump uh, test. And we capture all of the data for every test taker up until that point in time, noting those test takers that took it before the date we identified as the date it was stolen, and those that have done it after. So all of this is in preparation for the next page, step seven where we then make this information available to Cavion. So this is critical. With that information, we can see how many people have how many of the wrong answers matching, but that's not quite adequate to be able to point the finger at them. So we give all of this information to Cavion, and we ask how many of the matching answers, right or predominantly wrong, but right or wrong are enough to accuse and take action against the particular individual test taker. So basically, we call that setting the bar. Whatever that number is that we get back from Cavion tells us anybody who answered more than this is likely to have gotten a hold of the uh, study guide and memorized it. Those with fewer than that are likely to have taken the test independently. And we work with them to set that bar very high and conservatively for our legal group to approve. And so we go five standard deviations from what would likely be an indicator that they had access to the study guide. And five standard deviations makes it one chance in three and a half million that we might get a false positive. That, again, was more than adequate for our legal staff to say, OK, we're, we're good with that. So one in 300, one in 3,000, one in 30,000, eh, you know, a little nervous. One in three and a half million, no problem. You don't need to set up appeals. You can simply point to that individual and tell them what the consequence is. So if we can go to the next slide. Legal, as we've been talking, is a critical part of this equation. We could do nothing with our candidates taking action if we did not have the support of our legal team. And the reason is obvious. If any one of these individuals comes back to IBM and says, you're wrong, I lost my job, I'm suing you, we better have a full support, pre-support from legal 
that what we are doing is defensible from their point of view. And so we have met with them once a month, more frequently if needed, for the last two years on all sorts of security issues. We gained their approval. We gained their agreement that no retest was required because of where we set the bar. We agreed that what we do is we do a six-month ban from any future testing on the first occurrence, and they're told that on a second occurrence, it's a lifetime ban. And on that, we will also invalidate the score if, in fact, they pass the test and are identified as non-independent test taking. But in this particular case study, like I said, almost everybody failed because they had more than half of the answers they were memorizing were, in fact, wrong. And then we document everything to make sure we have each case carefully documented, including any email back and forth with the candidate that come along. And then lastly, the point I wanted to make is this is a wonderful path, but if you can't automate it on, on the next slide, if you can't automate it, then you're not going to be able to scale it. And so what we have done is set this up so that as you take a look at the uh, different steps, the only ones that are really manual are finding the test and buying it. But we can create the answer key automatically, generate the test file, send it to Caveon. We get less than a one-week turnaround, usually about one or two days. Generate the letters to the individuals who are found to be non-independent test takers. We are now implementing an auto filter. So once we know where the bar on test 123 should be set, we can program that into our test results tool so that as brand new results come in, this goes back to something Liz mentioned, as brand new results come back, come in, we immediately identify them as being above the bar and before anything is awarded to them which might have to be retracted or invalidated, we will immediately put them in a queue, send them the letter, ban them for six months. So that's the ideal case is that we get past the initial gathering of data, sending it to Caveon, setting the bar, and having to address anybody who fell above the bar up until that point, and then we get the automatic filter added so that anybody new that takes that test and goes above the bar is immediately contacted before any certification is awarded. And then we document that for any future challenges, as I mentioned before, and that's all automatic as well. We just take all the attachments. So I think that is the real flow between of, of what we've done. Uh, it works. It's the biggest, I would say, hardship we've had is that everybody that you tell, no matter how carefully you worded so far, that, you know, you violated policy. This is the reason that you're being uh, banned. They will all, almost all, come back and hit reply and, and ask you, well, what do you mean? I, I didn't. How could I have cheated on this first one? How could I have cheated? I failed. Well, we've updated the letter to say passing or failing makes no difference in our observation of whether you took the test non-independently. And we've tightened up that email over and over so that we can get to a point where we can stop them before they come back to us with emails requesting more information because that is also a non-automated step. We have some quick second and third emails, but you usually need to take a moment and address what specifically they're asking. So Jennifer has actually, in one of our calls earlier this week, suggested that we put together a web page with all of the defensible points that we can make and then point, you know, more than you want to put in the letter, but then point to that as well as educate others before they go out and use this material on what and how we're going about identifying these individuals and banning them from the program. So those are the specifics of the case study. So Steve, I'm going to pass it back to you for the next slide. Okay. Well, whoops. Should be lessons learned. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, and actually I want to ask Jennifer, so I, I, I so appreciate the process you've flagged it actually warms my heart Chuck and um, and you know clearly through iterations you've learned lessons there are other lessons that programs have learned and I've 
Jennifer, can you highlight some of those key things that we should all be aware of? Sure. In, in addition to the threshold point that you should be sure to have a, a solid candidate agreement in place that has terms that make clear the fact that uh, candidates are not permitted to test non-independently, I like that term, um, and that you have rights when and if you have a reason to question the validity of their score. Once, in addition to that, once it is time to make a decision about using statistics to invalidate scores, as we discussed, use simple language in your explanations, whether that is an explanation to the decision makers within your program or to the candidates perhaps whose scores are being invalidated. Um, describe the basis for the invalidation in a way that is easy to understand. Um, keep, along with that, keep the text short and the graphics basic. No one needs to earn their PhD in statistics when they're done with their discussion uh, with you. Instead, it should be uh, quick and easy and simple to understand why the question is being raised about this person's score. That's going to serve you, by the way, down the road in the event of a challenge when and if it's time to present your position to a judge or a jury, you'll, you'll be able to rely upon a simple layman's explanation. Include corroborating evidence, if there is any, any information beyond the statistics that supports the invalidation decision. And then finally, again, the focus is on the validity of the test score, not whether the test taker behaved badly, quote unquote, cheated, had a bad intent. The issue is their score is in question and you cannot in good faith stand behind it. I think those are the Key you know, for today. Yeah, so the score is in question and you can't stand behind it. Um, earlier, Jennifer, you had said proving and cheating are terms we should remove from our vocabulary. And I just want to, um, maybe the horse is dead, but uh, this really hit home for me, this perspective, two years ago at the National Conference on Student Assessment when Greg Sizek, he's from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, he's a preeminent measurement expert, he's former president of the National Council of Measurement and Education, he wrote the book Cheating on Tests, and um, it was the first time in his presentation where I heard someone clearly articulate what you just said. We're focused on the, we're focused on the score, not the behavior of the test taker. And, and also, as you had outlined previously, he articulated, hey, before you run any analyses, make sure you've got your house in order. Policies and procedures must be decided upon and implemented. Um, so I'm not going to read these for you. You can read them. But also, uh, once you decide upon your policies and procedures, they must be uniformly and consistently applied. And that's the way, if we follow the advice of this panel, if we follow the advice of experts like Greg Sizek, we can arrive at a place where we're effectively, uh, compellingly utilizing statistics to identify those scores that really are invalid that we just didn't know yet were invalid. And so with that, I want to thank Liz, Jennifer, and Chuck, the ITCC, and Pam, who's on the line, and, and open this up to any questions. Are there any questions that anyone on the panel can address for you? Steve, this is Rochelle. It looks like we do have one question in the question box. Um, would you like me to read that to you? Can you see that? Or? I, I've got it now. So um, okay. the question is, I'm confused about these Trojan questions. As I understand it, most brain dumps these days are community driven and rarely have correct answers until after the questions are researched and explanations are created. Chuck, I think, I think that as an, the IT cert industry has sort of taken the exercise of brain dumping 
and labeled certain for-profit websites as brain dumps. Is that right? Can can you yeah, help I mean, we, clarify there, this? There is. I mean, there are unfortunately hundreds and hundreds of these brain dump sites. There is an online tool. I want to say it's CircGuard. Actually, there is. and one of them specifically goes into that, but there are hundreds of them. I understand that some candidates don't get it and they think they're just getting a study guide. Legitimately get a lot of questions that you can study from, none of which are the actual ones. Well, not so in IT. Most everything that is out there with questions and answers are in fact brain dumps and they are triggered and clearly identified by 100% guarantee, money back, you know, you know, everybody passes all of these claims that makes it black and white clear that you are looking at actual test questions, however they got there. So that, that is clearly the case. On the Trojan horse, um, the Trojan horses end up out there if in fact it's the old all questions and all answers, or the Trojan horses end up out there, but people, what we find is that, that individuals we're identifying are ones who basically buy and memorize. They don't buy and study, they buy and memorize. And then they spit back such a close feedback of what was on that uh, brain dump site that that is when you take action. And they get caught in the Trojan horses because they don't even know, you know, what color is the sky? Green. You know, yep, that's what it told me. I guess that's what I'll answer. And they just simply spit it back. Excellent. So um, we are closing up on the hour. And so if um, the person who asked that question, if that helped, great. If you'd like additional uh, detail regarding that or other questions, here's everybody's email. And this group is very collegial, we, you know, I think it was uh, Jennifer that said a rising tide lifts all boats here. Um, if you've got questions, I know that either of these, any of these folks are, are happy to um, provide whatever support and, and answers they can. Um, so and, and Steve, I'll tell you what, let me just make another 30 seconds. If anybody has not gone out onto the ITCC site, itcertificationcouncil.org, and gone to the test security tab, there are a number of white papers and resources that could help you build up a little knowledge, what forms of cheating, what are different best practices around it. So there are resources available on our very website to help if folks have not yet tap those. That's right. So thank you, everybody, for participation today. We hope uh, we've been able to share some useful, helpful content. And uh, here's to better protecting all of our intellectual property. Have a great day.